Good morning and welcome. Happy Easter. We're glad that you're here this morning on the Feast of the Resurrection. We're especially glad if you're visiting this morning. I want to invite you to check out the uh, pew racks in front of you. There are welcome cards there that you can fill out uh, to give us a little bit of contact information so we can get to know you and hopefully you can get to know us better very soon. We're glad that you're here with us. Um, I only have one thing I want to draw attention to before I hand it over to Gretchen for announcements. And that is that the um, next Sunday, we'll have at least four baptisms uh, going on next Sunday morning. We want to invite you to come back next Sunday and be a part of that. It should be a wonderful celebration with those families. I so hope you can be a part of it as well. Thank you. Good to see you this morning. Good morning and happy Easter. Um, I'm Gretchen, a member of the vestry. And I'm going to remind you of church activities going on today and through the week. Uh, special thank you, though, for all of you that have donated to the Easter flowers. They really are special uh, gift to all of us. And the banners, I don't know if uh, the McCrays are here, but they came from Norman, Oklahoma to put the banners up. And Susie and Doug, and Susie has made all of the um, banners. Uh, after the service today, um, please go out the east door, and under the pergola, there are over 200 uh, tassels, and they were done by the uh, Horizon Arts uh, members, and it's from a Ken Walker. Uh, saw these hanging at the Kaufman Gardens down on the plaza, and so he brought this idea back 
to St. Michael's. So please go out and enjoy all of the um, uh, colors as they represent um, a celebration of the growth and new beginnings and the resurrection. And the, uh, you might want to take a selfie under them today uh, before the rain tomorrow. And the kitchen angels have said they have lots of the um, cross, cross, hot cross muffins uh, still available. So please go have coffee and a muffin. And the diaper packaging party on Thursday from 1 to 3. And the address is in your bulletin. Or did we get a bulletin today? Anyway, it's on the um, week by week. So call uh, uh, Rich LaBelle if you have any questions. And please consider signing up for a dinner group. Um, it's a wonderful way to meet other parishioners, have interesting conversations, always good food, and you'll have um, fun. Ministry leaders uh, and volunteers, please consider hosting a coffee hour after the service and contact Tracy Henry if you're interested. Now, wishing you a blessed Christmas, pardon me, Easter, <laughs> an Easter season filled with peace in the presence of the risen Lord. Thank you. Christ is risen.
be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life, grant that we who celebrate with joy the day of the Lord's resurrection may be raised from the death of sin by your life-giving Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from Acts. Peter began to speak to Cornelius and the other Gentiles. I truly understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. The message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord.
A reading from Corinthians. I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, and which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you, as of first importance, what I had in turn had received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. The word of the Lord. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The Gospel of the Lord.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. We have been this year working through the Gospel of Mark. Um, this being Easter, we're skipping to the end. After the Easter season, we'll go back and we'll read through the stories about Mark and Jesus' teachings uh, to the end of the church year. But today we skip to the very end, and we have this very uh, surprising end to the Gospel of Mark. If you look in the Bible, probably I think even the ones in the pews in front of you, and you look at the end of the Gospel of Mark, you'll find notations by scholars that point out that there are a couple endings there that we know for a fact were added. They weren't originally a part of the Gospel. We know this because our oldest copies of the Gospel of Mark don't have them, right? Our Gospel today, the ending of the Gospel of Mark, ends with the word afraid. That's not what we expect at the end of the gospel. We have this story of the women coming to the tomb. They go inside and there's this dude in a white robe. No wings, no halo, no glowing, no nothing. Just a guy in a robe. Hanging out in the corner. Who tells them that Jesus is risen. And then Mark tells us that they fled the tomb and they were filled with terror and amazement and they didn't tell anybody because they were afraid. The end. And if you've been paying attention this, this year, talking about the Gospel of Mark, you know it's the first Gospel. Matthew and Luke weren't satisfied with this, so they had all these extra stuff at the ending of theirs. This is how it ends. Now, I interpret this to mean that they did tell the disciples, because after all, the, the audience of Mark's gospel, they knew the story. They knew what had happened. There were churches all over the place by this point. So something had happened, and so I take it to mean that they did exactly as this guy in the tomb told them to, and they went and told the disciples, but they didn't tell anybody else, because they were afraid. And one can imagine them wondering themselves what in the world is going on, what's the meaning of this, as they ran away. Not what we suspect on Easter. But as we think about the meaning of things, I want to turn to a reading that we had in our vigil last night from the book of Romans. Where Paul says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Do you notice how Paul began that remark? He didn't say we were baptized into the resurrection. We were baptized into life. We were baptized into joy, baptized into victory. He said we were baptized into his death. Now, if you were here on Good Friday, this won't surprise you. That we have to go through death first before we can get to life. We stood here on Good Friday we venerated the cross, confronted with our own sinfulness and brokenness and limitedness and finitude that prevents us from being what God wanted us to be. And didn't Jesus tell us that you have to lose your life to gain it? You have to give it up in order to get true life. So this resurrected life, this transcendent life, that first confronts the women at the tomb. It is definitely a gift, but a particular kind of gift. It is not a winning lottery ticket that we purchased for 10 bucks or whatever they cost now. It's not an entitlement. It's not something that we earned or that we deserved. 
Rather, this gift is an invitation and an opportunity. It is a gift that requires our consent. It requires our consent because it, there's a lot involved in it. Again, we have to lose our life to gain it. This transcendent, resurrected life is a gift to which we have to give ourselves in order truly to receive it or to realize it. It requires a devotion, refusing to let go of the vision of this transcendent life, even when the world threatens to overwhelm us or when we are tempted by simpler, easier, more pleasing ways of life. But it doesn't end there, in Paul's remarks. We are baptized into his death so that we can walk in newness of life. To walk in newness of life. If you're from a tradition like I am, originally, in which you were baptized by immersion, you may have heard these words at your baptism. We are baptized with him into death and raised to walk in newness of life. This newness of life contains strange, unbelievable possibilities that we can't imagine on our own. It also requires us to be, to be courageous, to be willing to be different, because we'll have to look different than the rest of the world around us. We'll behave differently. We'll have different attitudes, different values, different ways of interacting with one another. But this isn't some kind of dualism where it's the, the heavenly world versus the earthly world and they clash. This is actually about growing. It's about growing up. It's about being different tomorrow than you are today. Different next week than you are this week. Growing up into being the kind of people that God wanted us to be from our creation to begin with. There's a movie that came out in the 1980s. I've referenced it before. Uh, it's called The Mission. My favorite movie. I think it's still the greatest movie ever made. It is about Jesuit missionaries in South America uh, working uh, with a people called the Guarani on the plateau in Central South America. It follows two characters especially. Captain Mendoza a mercenary and slave trader, and Father Gabriel, a Jesuit priest. Not to spoil everything, Mendoza commits a horrible act, horrible even in his own mind. And he's overwhelmed with guilt and has decided he just wants to die. He's confronted by Father Gabriel, who wants to try and help him in some way, and Mendoza tells him, there is no life for me. There is no um, repentance. There is no um, reconciliation. And Father Gabriel tells him, he says, you chose your crime. Do you have the courage to choose your penance? And so Mendoza chooses as his penance to carry his sins around with him. He takes the armor, the helmet, the sword, all the accoutrements of his mercenary life, and he wraps them in a large net that's four or five feet at least in diameter. And he ties them to himself. And he carries them around with him wherever he goes. And he decides that he wants to go with the Jesuit missionaries up the plateau to where the Guarani are. The Guarani, the very people that he murdered and enslaved. It's this uh, rigorous effort, you can imagine, to carry this thing up the sides of a cliff face, basically in a waterfall to get to the top. He finally gets there, they're among the Guarani, and the Guarani recognize who he is. They remember him as the one who murdered them and captured them and sold them into slavery. And one of the Guarani puts a knife to his throat and there's a conversation between the leader of the Guarani and the priests and this man with a knife who then moves the knife and cuts the rope and pushes 
Mendoza sends over the cliff. It is the most powerful portrayal of grace that I know of, ever. And Mendoza's left in this mix of weeping and laughter as he's embraced by these people that he sought to kill and to enslave. Life is defined, this transcendent life, is defined by our capacity to grow closer to God, no matter what. That's what's made possible on this Easter. If we are willing to consent to our own death so that we can live, this is what Jesus promises us. But this transcendent life is not something that you can put in your pocket. I remember the old Looney Tunes cartoons where Bugs Bunny would take a whole house and fold it up and put it in his pocket. It drove me nuts as a kid. You can't do that. <clears throat> and you can't do that with this transcendent life. It is not something that you can manipulate and control and turn into your own. It is something that will take you over. It's a wild force that you can't domesticate. You can't manipulate. You can't make it a tool for yourself. If you're really going to consent to it, if you're really going to let yourself die so that you can live, you have to surrender entirely to it. But I return to the women at the tomb who were overwhelmed with fear. We enter this new life, this transcendent, resurrected life with fear and trepidation because it will be challenging. But isn't that the way we begin every great adventure? There will be aspects of it that are terrifying. There'll be parts of it that we're not sure we can do. We're not sure we can accomplish or manage or endure. There are also things about it that excite us, that make us yearn to get on with the journey. This is the way great adventures begin. They require us to take risks. As we talked about last Sunday, as Jesus chose to get on this donkey and mock worldly powers, he went into Jerusalem knowing that there would be consequences for this. It's willingness to take risks. But don't forget the amazement. Yes, the women were filled with terror, it says, but they were filled with amazement as well. There are things that can happen in and through us that will, in fact, amaze us if we surrender and consent to this gift of this transcendent life. As people who live this life, we don't get to be the powerful people making everyone else do what we think they should. We don't get to control others. We don't get to manipulate them. We live the way Jesus did. We invite and we welcome we invite and we welcome. We invite and we welcome. We live a life of Christ-like love, justice, mercy, and peace, exemplifying what those virtues look like and inviting others to join us in that life so that they too can know the transcendence that comes with Christ's resurrection. It is through living a Christ-like life that we declare together, the Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Amen. Please stand as you're able, and let us say together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father,
Let us pray. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God, for you have given us true life in Jesus Christ. We pray for the church, Christ's body in the world. Our faithful minister in Jesus' name. For wisdom and prudence for political leaders throughout the world. For the natural world that nourishes and sustains us. For the end of discrimination, oppression, violence, and war. For those who struggle in the midst of poverty and hunger. For those who are hurting in body, mind, or spirit. We pray for those in our parish in need of your healing presence, Kelly Atkins, Father Kesner Ajax, Michael Box, Ray and Donna Birchfield, Alex Cardiff, Jerry Cormack, Judy Gerling, Stacy Heisler, Robin Kilo, Pat Matthews, Kathy Minges, Tommy Muhlander, Betsy Ordonez, Ed O'Donnell, Barbie Richards, Kristen Smith, Jay Weidenmeyer, and Mary Wiggins. We pray for our loved ones who have died, especially Roger Boyd, Eugene Butler, Mary Ann Butler. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal Mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Again, welcome everyone. Please be seated. So glad that you could all be here today on the Feast of the Resurrection. Hope you enjoy a wonderful day after you leave this afternoon. Um, I want to say just a couple quick words about communion. Uh, when you come forward, uh, ushers will let you know when it's time to come forward. And when you do, just come around the altar on both sides. Those of you who know the drill, make sure to help any guests out that need to uh, have some, some help getting around. Um, when you come forward, you may stand or kneel, depending which you prefer. If you would like to receive bread only, hold your hands out like this, right? Uh, if you would like us to dip the, the bread in wine first, then do not do this, 
do anything else and you'll be okay. We'll dip it in the wine and we'll hand it to you for you to take it from us like so. Um, if you'd not like to take bread or wine, just like to receive a blessing, feel free to cross your arms over your chest like so. We're happy to offer a blessing on your behalf. Additionally, and everybody listen up for this, this is not something we normally do, we will have a, another station for the Eucharist down here at the bottom of the steps. Uh, it's for anybody, but especially for those for whom the steps might be a challenge. If you'd like to come forward just on this side, we're happy to provide you communion over here in front of the lectern. Again, we're glad that you're here this morning. Hope that you experience God's presence with you now and as you leave.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being. Sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways. But we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. sin and death, and to reveal the riches of your grace. You looked with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick, and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. And the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you and gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ, crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, Bring us with all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
this congregation we send you forth very usefully gifts that those to whom you go may share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. We who are many are one body because we all share one bread. This being the season of Easter, I invite you to stand. Together let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for restoring us in your image and nourishing us with spiritual food in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. Now send us forth a people forgiven, healed, renewed that we may proclaim your love to the world and continue in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. The God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen.
Thank you.